This has come up a lot, but we saw this specifically in the New York Times while we were traveling. They're openly acknowledging and admitting that China is facing a demographic crisis and that there is indeed, quote, a global fertility crisis that is underway. And, you know, after more than a decade of studying eugenics and following these issues and trying to really understand what's underneath them and what it really means under the propaganda. I mean, I can't say I'm surprised, but it seems significant for the New York Times to acknowledge it on page one. And yes, it was an op-ed, but they openly just talked about what a mistake it all was with China's one-child policy, the overpopulation bomb crisis, and these are all corollaries to the ongoing environmental crisis that, that is currently being propagandized about. So it seems significant. So it's this op-ed by Ross uh, Duthat that we saw. I mean, go ahead and read them some passages. Yeah, I just really quickly want to mention, just because they slap the word opinion on something, when you print this on the cover, the front page of the New York Times, that's promoting that that viewpoint. They can try to distance themselves by using the word opinion, but... That doesn't mean anything. It's on the front page of the New York Times. So this is titled, China Faces a Population Crisis Anew. And when we saw it, we were just pretty blown away. Because this this comes after decades of this same publication and other mainstream publications that are held supposedly up as this grand standard of media promoting the exact opposite belief, that the world is overpopulated, there's going to be a population bomb, the world is just going to fall out of space, I guess, with with the, the weight of all the people and everything. And now they're just admitting that all of that was wrong, and they're trying to act like it was all just a mistake. So we're going to read this to you and discuss it because it's pretty mind blowing. It says, in recent days, both this newspaper and the Wall Street Journal have carried reports on one of the most important geopolitical facts of the 21st century. The world's great rising power, the People's Republic of China, is headed for a demographic crisis. Like the United States and most developed countries, China has a birth rate that is well below replacement level. Unlike most developed countries, China is growing old without first having grown rich. This is well understood by people who follow the news and who know about the issue. It's established. You know, what it means is a secondary thing, but everyone knows this, except the general population still tends to go around talking about overpopulation and how there should be less children. And there's people who don't want to have children for that reason. I've overheard people bragging about getting abortions because of the population crisis and that sort of thing. You know, to each their own, make your own decision. But if you're making those decisions because you're misinformed, <laughs> I mean, they admit, believing all this propaganda. Maybe I don't even want to step into that. It's just no, it, no, it, it should be stepped into because you have the average people walking around with this belief that they've been programmed with for decades that the world is just so burdened with human beings. And see, part of the problem with it is, is a lot of people live in cities. So their entire perspective is based on what's around them physically. And they think, oh, this city's got a lot of people, so it must be like this everywhere. Then you actually leave the city and travel in the world and you realize there are large swaths of land that are completely void of all people. There's a lot of areas that are not populated at all. The figures don't match the the belief, and it doesn't matter though. It's not they're not going out of their way to try and correct this. I mean, this is not the belief that's being promoted. So the fact that this is on the front page of the New York Times is pretty mind blowing. When I tell people overpopulation is a myth, I get all kinds of hate and trolls and people trying to argue with me about it. But if you actually look at the data, Most all of the developed world is under replacement rate, including the United States. All of us are. Every, all the countries are. I mean, the thing is, people are walking around still talking about the population crisis that's been programmed in ever since World War II, especially, uh, at least heavily for the last uh, 50 years plus. Before we talk about ideological penetration itself, let's take a look at the reasons why this form of penetration is so important. And it's misinformed opinion that's now acknowledged to be untrue and yet the purpose is there you know this is about the power relationship and as we go further into this you've got to understand admitting there's a global demographic dearth 
that the demographic population is falling out like a crumbling mountain is an acknowledgement that we're facing a return to global poverty. You know, this is an age of austerity, and they've actually sold us on the reason for choosing to do it instead of accepting it as an inevitability is to help the earth, to save the earth, to address the environmental and ecological crises when it's really a result of their pushing of this issue. Yet we are increasing our population as if they were infinite. This fact is at the core of our environmental problems. The number of people in the world has increased as much in the past 50 years as it increased in a thousand years before. Uh, because this is about diminishing the individual and enhancing the collective, taking the power away from individuals and families and recollectivizing society. This is about taking global problems that require global solutions so that somebody can get global jurisdiction, you know. But how is it being sold? Not in that way. This should be a wake-up call. Before I continue, I just want to point out, too, that they came out and said that China's population was going to be stabilized in 2029. That was last January, January 2019. Then they had to come out five months later and admit that actually it, it could happen in 2023. That is how quickly this is going on. Like it is, it is, we're going to see this happen in our lifetimes, that these populations in various countries are going to stabilize and start going down quickly because people are not having children. It, a lot of it is the, is the propaganda, but a lot of it also is there's a huge issue with people being infertile due to a lot of these environmental pollutants, the things that are in the food, air, and water, stuff like that that's going on as well. So we've got two issues here, but I don't know how many times I've heard people talk about how there's just too many people, and they're just parroting propaganda. They're not actually looking at the actual data. Yeah, so, chi China abandoned the one-child policy. I forget the exact date, but because it was acknowledged, they officially went too far with it. So he goes on to say, of course China has grown richer, but even after years of growth, Chinese per capita GDP is still about a third or fourth the size of neighboring countries like South Korea and Japan. And yet its birth rate has converged with the rich world much more quickly and completely, which has two interrelated implications, both of them grim. First, China will have to pay for the care of a vast elderly population without the resources available to richer societies facing the same challenge, which is all of them right now. Second, China's future growth prospects will dim with every year of below replacement birth rates because low fertility creates a self-reinforcing cycle in which a less youthful society loses dynamism and growth, which reduces economic support for would-be parents, which reduces birth rates, which reduces growth, dot, 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 rinse and repeat. Yeah, and this is a problem that all Western society is facing as, long, as well as the East, that there's not enough money to care for the aging population hence tax problems and so on and so forth. But it's even worse in China and other Asian countries because they have a quasi-formal structure where traditionally for thousands of years, the, the, the siblings split the cost of caring for their parents when they aged. And for a long time, it, it was very common for Chinese families to have four siblings. They split the cost of caring for the parents. But in the age of the one-child policy, it puts all of that burden on the one child, so they're less likely to have the extra money to start a family and sustain a new generation. It's a whole spiraling issue. China is now conducting an intensive family planning campaign. The government encourages late marriages and small families. Barefoot Dr. Xiao Xu delivers a once-a-month birth control pill that is being tested on her commune near Shanghai. Chinese factories in Shanghai produce more birth control pills than any other country in the world. Vasectomies and tubal ligations are encouraged for parents who have completed their families. Patients receive time off with pay during the operation and recuperation period. Abortions may be performed in the event of contraceptive failure. But the pros and cons of various methods are discussed in a small family planning booklet that newlywed couples receive as a gift from the state. One of the most important aspects of China's family planning campaign is providing jobs for women. Women comprise 80% of the employees at this lock factory. 
The factory's barefoot doctors keep track of the women's menstrual cycles and deliver birth control pills at the proper time. Yeah, and it says the Times report on China's birth rates also reminds us that this trap is cultural, quoting a young Chinese woman who remarks of her one-child policy-shaped generation, We're all only children, and to be honest, a little selfish. How can I raise a child when I'm still a child myself? This is the glib explication of a real problem. Having kids, inevitably one of the harder things that human beings do, feels harder still in a society where children are invisible, siblings absent, and large families rare, where there aren't ready exemplars or forms of solidarity for people contemplating parenthood. And that's something I think that we are seeing all over the Western world with the rise of technology. As people are having less children, people are becoming children for longer. Like here in America, for example, you have a very high percentage of the population in their 30s and 40s still living with their parents. Yeah, I mean, I think really this is about deliberate social engineering. We're emulating the family model and taking after your older brother or your father and their profession. You know, that goes away and you forget how to be a family person and and you're more easily sort of molded by the government's instituted program I mean, this is a new type of society that's happening on purpose, and they're acting like this is an accidental problem. I mean, or they're I acting like this is just the natural progression of a world with technology. Perpetual children. I mean, this is the world of the Eloy that H.G. Wells predicted in The Time Machine. I mean, this is where <laughs> it, it just it, – it's all interrelated here. It is. And I've seen people commenting on how they've noticed there are a lot more g- grown men – for all intents and purposes, they're adult men, but they're like adult children. They play video games all the time. They're collecting comic book figurines and all this kind of stuff. But the thing is, this is all part and parcel of social engineering, a society that will be much more readily dependent when, say, a digital cashless government run socialist system is brought in. I mean, that's people will jump to that because they will be have been conditioned to to accept it for many years. And so there's this whole side effect of seeing grown ups acting like children. It's because they're engineering everyone to basically be children of this system. The system will replace the family unit. I mean, that is what is actually happening here. So they don't want you to have kids because you are going to be the kid. That's the plan. I mean, used to be, for example, I mean, in my generation, which now I feel old when I say phrases like in my generation, but, you know, when I was a teenager, all we wanted was a driver's license. That is all we wanted. Why? Because we wanted freedom. And we equated the ability to get behind the wheel of a car and go wherever you want that license with that sense of freedom, it was kind of a rite of passage into adulthood. We don't even have that now. People, kids, the kids aren't learning how to drive cars and get their license. They don't even think about freedom in that way. The concept of freedom itself has been eroded and degraded, and it's just not high on the list of priorities anymore. Because you could just take an Uber, you could just take whatever, you could just take local transport. But really, it's all about locking everything down into a controlled system. I agree. And I think this goes really deep into the aspects of the technocratic society that Jacques Ellul wrote about and Zbigniew Brzezinski wrote about and and so many other authors that they're putting us in a simulacrum, a matrix of systems and giving us equivalents that are efficient to produce and easily automated and instituted by a computerized system, you know, even if people are involved. Follow the crowd. We've reached a million, two million, five million. Watch us grow. Going up. It's new. It's automatic. It dictates, records, seals, sterilizes, stamps, and delivers in one operation without human hand. What am I bid? What am I offered? Sold. Who's next? And they're telling us, like, well, you, the family, that was too much because of population and environment. But you have the, the equivalent of a family, you know, oh, because the, the nuclear family was a tyranny, right? That was a tyranny you enforced have, upon you. You have the equivalency of intimacy. It's that whole like lab experiment that a little mechanical hand with a bird's duck beak on it is equivalent to a mother in raising, you know, a, a baby duck or whatever. Exactly. You know, if it feeds it enough pellets and touches it, it's somehow the same. Well, it's not. It's not the same. No. But this is what we're seeing now. And all these people think that this is their idea. This is this has been their idea when really this is something that's been pushed and promoted on them 
through every avenue. I mean, we're seeing it everywhere right now. This this promotion of people are basically the enemy. We're the we're the enemy of ourselves. We need to band together against ourselves for the earth, for the environment, not have children. I mean, it's the age of anti-fertility, everything. Right. And they admit in this article, it's acknowledged on the front page of the New York Times, you know, what happened in China was not an accident and it wasn't a Chinese Oh, plant. we're getting to that. And they don't name the Rockefellers, but anyone who's researched the issue Obviously. knows that that family is first and foremost on the list of those who designed this and sold it, pushed it and promoted it. And in China, forced it. They used overt forced measures to force abortions, to force sterilization, to limit um, the number of children to one with penalties that are quite severe. They brought this down upon society in a way that's very inhumane, doesn't reflect the progress of the future that everyone wants. And it's not that far off from the kind of solutions that are being sold today for the environmental crisis, climate change, and all these sorts of things. They're getting people to accept and even to demand solutions to these problems that they shouldn't accept because they're not humane. These are not good moral policies. They're getting people to demand demographic suicide everywhere, demanding your own suicide. That's essentially what it is. And for more on that, look no further than an article that came out in The Guardian back in November. So just a few months ago, titled, I Wish I'd Never Been Born, The Rise of the Antinatalists. Adherents view life not as a gift and a miracle, but a harm and an imposition. And their notion that having children may be a bad idea seems to be gaining mainstream popularity. Gee, you think it could be because of mainstream outlets like The Guardian obviously promoting it? Just saying. And it talks about how this 27-year-old Indian man actually sued his parents last year for giving birth to him because it wasn't his decision to be born. And he told the BBC that human existence is totally pointless. Then he went on to say that it's wrong to bring new people into the world without their consent, because that even makes any kind of sense whatsoever. Then he said he wanted to sue his parents for a symbolic sum of money, such as a single rupee, quote, to instill that fear among parents in general, because now parents don't think before having a child which I think is actually the opposite. They have now forced this idea into people's heads so hard that people are thinking so much about it that people aren't having children. It's like the beginning of the film Idiocracy. But anyway, it goes on to talk about this spreading belief of antinatalism. According to this logic, the question of whether to have a child is not just a personal choice, but an ethical one. And the correct answer is always no. I mean, this is what blew our minds is, so they admit that, and they admit what I've said so far on the front page, right? Then you flip and and read the rest of the article, and what they actually go ahead and admit in here really blew my mind, because the thing is, is the New York Times especially, they they were so pushing this population bomb idea. They were really promoting that and propagandizing everyone that that was what was gonna happen that it was going to be this Malthusian nightmare and everything else for decades, right? And mm-hmm. now, and now they have to, they're good. They're going back on everything they ever said, and they're actually admitting in print this. Now, li- listen, as Lyman Stone writes in the latest National Review, the human race is increasingly facing a quote global fertility crisis, not just a European or American or Japanese baby bust. It's global. It's a crisis that threatens ever slower growth in the best case. In the worst case, to cite a recent paper by the Stanford economist Charles Jones, it risks, quote, an empty planet result. Knowledge and living standards stagnate for a population that gradually vanishes, end quote. Yeah. Then in a parathetical, it says, and aside to answer a predictable objection, yes, in an age of stagnation, CO2 levels won't grow as fast, delaying some of climate change's effects, because, you know, it's the New York Times, they got to bring this up. But at the same time, a stagnant society will struggle to innovate enough to escape the climate crisis permanently. So now they're saying because there won't be enough people to solve the problem of the climate change, like climate change either way, right? Because now, even if there's less people, they're saying that's bad too, because less people means there won't be enough people to figure out the problem. So (laughs) one way or the other, climate change is just... That's it. Science is settled, right? It says, and yes, an empty planet wouldn't have a climate change problem at all. But if that's your goal, your misanthropy is terminal. 
So that's a little parenthetical. But then he goes on to say, within this general global story, though, the Chinese case is also distinctive because cruel policy choices made its demographic problems worse. For these choices, the one-child policy and the forced abortions and sterilizations and infanticide the policy either required or encouraged, the communist regime bears a heavy burden of guilt. And the guilt continues to build because even with the one-child policy gone, the regime's repression still effectively suppresses birth rates. By targeting minority and religious populations, Beijing is attacking the country's more fecund groups in what amounts to a statement that if Han birth rates have fallen, minority birth rates must be cut to match. Now this is the kicker, he says, but alongside the communist guilt, there's Western guilt as well, because the one-child policy was linked to a project hatched by Western technocrats, funded by Western institutions, and egged on by Western intellectuals, a classist, sexist, racist, anti-religious program that sought to defuse a, quote, population bomb that we know now would have defused itself without forced sterilization programs in India and signs in Chinese villages saying, quote, you can beat it out, you can make it fall out, you can abort it, but you cannot give birth to it. In China, family planning is not only a personal matter, but a national concern. Messages are broadcast over radio and the ever-present loudspeaker. The advantage of having small families and limiting population growth are explained in terms of promoting better health and improving living standards for all. That last quote comes from Unnatural Selection, one of two books I recommend reading on the subject. The other is Matthew Connolly's Fatal Misconception. Both are mostly retrospective. The Western effort died away as the population bomb fizzled because there wasn't one. And while its Malthusianism endures around the edges of environmentalism and in European anxieties about African migration, mostly the population control crusade is recalled as a mistaken extrapolation, a well-meaning mistake. But news from China is a reminder that a harsher sort of memory is appropriate. As we contemplate the demographic challenge of the future, we should reserve particular opprobrium for those who chose, in the arrogance of their supposed humanitarianism, to use coercive and foul means to make the great problem of the 21st century worse. And that's where this article is double relevant because this is happening all over again. And, you know, this most recent wave of propaganda has put in everyone's face it's an it's an emergency. There's 12 years, no, maybe 18 months, and then the <laughs> Earth it will just explode, or whatever, guess, or you know. implode, or so people are ready to accept extreme measures, and that's the warning of history. That's what we're not supposed to repeat. That's why everyone talks about World War II and the tyrannies that took place then. You know, that's what we're not supposed to do, and yet, strangely. What we're being called to do under moral pretenses, you know, (laughs) it's demographic suicide, it's self-harm. And it's it's just so ironic. I've never realized more than in this past year how much this earth is controlled by fertility cults. And they're acknowledging here, you know, there's this crisis with the demographics and it means slow growth in the best case scenario Worst case, an empty planet of total extinction, which itself is kind of fear-mongering. But the point is, these are policies where we're signing on for our own self-extinction, and it's not because of a barren earth that is unable to produce and to provide. You know, that's been the misconception they deliberately put in our face. But really, the underlying problem is that our species is doing it to themselves under the guise of mismanagement. But that's really a ruse, too, because it's been deliberate all along. It's been arrogant, misanthropic uh, people who want to erase and rewrite and have us be mediated by technology and are selling us that the new magic of fertility is going to come through technology exclusively and that every problem should have a technological solution, even if the problems are being caused by it. And and that's (laughs) just the story of our age. I mean, there's 10 million examples of that. But a couple months ago, we interviewed uh, an old 90-year-old man who makes corn dollies. His name is Raymond Rush. He's in Britain. He comes out of this agricultural tradition where they do little kind of like folk magic rituals that have these invested beliefs in them 
of the continuity and regeneration of crops. And he talks about how, you know, his little tradition of making corn dollies, it's dying out. And it has been ever since uh, the post-World War II rise of automated harvesting machines and automated planters. And and that it's just been disastrous. It, it's displaced our tie to the earth and our understanding of how things uh, traditionally continue while it's empowered this technology to manage our lives and mediate for us and reduce our individualism, it itself is environmentally destructive. The monocrop pesticide model has eradicated all kinds of species. It's untangled a lot of the biodiverse complexity, the very things they propagandize about promoting, they've been destroying with this technology. When you grow one crop, you don't have 15 species of birds and one likes this crop and this one likes this and you have all the intermingling that really makes things productive. They've been thinning things out, uh, growing super pest and making the environment uh, more vulnerable day by day and our relationship to that environment um, just disappear, right? Which, which, is a, which is a form of further control. Well, that's my whole point that I've written out. It's all about control. Like they've been telling us that, oh, the population bomb is now a demographic bomb. And this is all supposed to be like a bitter but good news because of the environment, right? Well, that's less people. And in the face of this hyped global catastrophe, we're accepting austerity for the planet. And it's a good misdirection for accepting more control and less economic advantage. It's about more control and we're being sold on the idea that it's good because of the planet when really it's a destruction and, you know, it's not environmental either. It's depleted our economic standards and that's true for the rising generations of young people as well as the fading generations of older people. That's the thing. There are people, academics, who came out with the population bomb scare and jumped on that train and they were freaking out about it back in the day. And even they have had to go back on what they were originally saying because they have now looked at the data and run numbers and they realize none of that stuff was actually happening. It was not true. And the thing is, you're talking about governments promoting these ideals as well, despite the fact that they had some of the largest computers ever built going on in the entire Cold War they knew what the figures were. They weren't confused about it. This was on purpose to basically engineer for a future where they didn't need as many people because everything is going to be automated and they just don't need us for it. They don't need pe- the human capital, the human resource is not as necessary anymore in a world automated by technology. I mean, you're right, but it's not just that they're, they have computers and researchers and they're tracking it. The development of the computer has been about managing the population. This has been engineered like an economic Exactly. Bubble. So the point that I'm making is it's not a mistake. They didn't accidentally, it was not like they had bad data and they went, oh, the population bomb because our data is wrong. They knew what the data was and they promoted this idea anyway, despite the fact that now even the New York Times has to admit it's debunked, despite the fact that now if you actually look at the data, the entire Western world is in a basically a demographic. He said it's a global fertility crisis because it is. They took away the one-child policy in China, but people still aren't having kids because they've already engineered them not to. They have engineered everybody not to. They're engineering everybody to accept you know, full-term abortions and all kinds of things. If you look at the numbers, they're talking about populations stabilizing in our lifetimes now. Like, we're going to see this. It's not some far-off day in the way future that this is, you know, 100 years from now that this is going to happen. The only organization right now that's not admitting this is the United Nations. And in an article I read about it, they said the reason the United Nations is showing that the population isn't going to stabilize until 2099 is because they have not run their figures to account for urbanization, which is a total joke. one of their core propaganda Yeah, it's one of their core things that they have to have. So, of course, they're not going to say that. But also... Not accounting for urbanization is a joke because that's all they're doing is pushing people into cities. And then once you're in one of these overcrowded areas that they forced everyone into, then they say, well, see, look how overpopulated this This is. is, Holy cow. This is what makes this diabolical because most everyone could agree on the sentiment of these principles. But because of people's religious-like belief in these principles, save the earth, do it for the thing, you know, they can't hear 
the logical argument anymore, which is dangerous. It's dangerous as f- because they're using this misdirection and this deception to gain global power and control our lives. And just as George Carlin said in one of his great stand-up routines, that they're making you uh, happier with increasingly uh, shittier conditions. You know, they're selling us a bill of goods and talking us into it. And it's completely backwards. I mentioned fertility cults, and and when you study those, you know, you're talking about priest classes who sell people on superstitious ideas to promote the common goals, right? I mean, fertility cults were based around performing ceremonial magic rituals, and this happened in seemingly every culture. It was a universal principle. And the whole idea of performing this magic and doing what the priest class says is to promote the abundance, the fertility, literally, of agriculture, livestock, your own progeny, and the general wealth of your community, right? Because an increase in numbers, especially if it's healthy and thriving crops and everything, it corresponds with the increased wealth. That's what they're after and what they're trying to multiply, But this past half century and this past century of eugenics has been an inversion of that. We're celebrating the perceived wealth of destroying ourselves and destroying our own fertility and the biodiversity and the cute bunnies and everything else that everybody wants, you know, seals and polar bears and everything. It's all being wiped away by completely unwise decision making, except the priest class really knows the calculation and the numbers of this, and they're selling the people on a religious-like belief in an anti-fertility, that saving the earth comes at a cost of your own abundance and that you should be happy to pay that price through eugenics, collectivism, both politically and economically, a planned economy, family planning, layoffs, planned obsolescence, paid furrows for farmers not to plant, unemployment and welfare benefits that always just make things worse and worse, not eating meat and using birth control, you know, each of which might be part of individual decisions. But look at what they're overall promoting in this in this culture, that technology should and could regulate the population, our fertility, regulate our diet and our very mindset about the environment that we're in. It's all supposed to be controlled by technology because we're not wise enough or smart enough to control our own fertility and abundance. And that it would be better for us to die off and for our influence in the system to die off and our individualism to yield to this collective organism that's supposed to be superior on completely bunk means. I mean, they're literally telling us, <laughs> you saw it in the subway, Melissa, they're, they're showing us we should be happy with just adequate, that we should be happy with equivalency. It's like segregated schools and 3D printed food paste or something and knock off sodas and sneakers. You know, it's this myth um, that we're all going to be treated equally and fairly by some computer program. Meanwhile, those with means, those with connections to the priest class who have enough money to see through it or who just know better because they're in on it, they multiply their wealth and their fertility for their own and they propagate that and concentrate it while they tell you to give it up uh, for some moral purpose. It's the anti-fertility. It's, it's anti, the death cult. It's literally it's a death anti-fertility. Cult. I mean, you know, maybe you saw our documentary, Obsolete. This is about replacement and purpose. There's the the universal rule of regeneration that everyone inherently knows. And you know what the phrase is, you reap what you sow. So what is being reaped and what is being sown and, and who is doing <laughs> right? that reaping and that sowing? You know, this, this admission so late in the game about the demographic crisis and the false population bomb, and the global is very fertility important crisis. to recognize, it's a direct warning you know, about the foolishness, above all about the foolishness of going along with this when it's obviously happening again in society, the global climate crisis, the widespread calls to promote uh, veganism and uh, stop selling meat, to imitate meat in factories and have technology make food that's supposed to be equivalent. They're actually selling Soylent as a meal replacement product on shelves today. We live in a world where this is in our face and we're actually buying into our own demise and death. It is anti-fertility and it's It's anti-human. It's completely (laughs) devastating to humanity itself. It's unnecessary 
uh, from a problem solving perspective and it's actually counterproductive and it's literally fruitless with the potential to exacerbate the crisis. It's literally anti-fertility and uh, it can't be good for the planet really, but I think this is more about what's happening to our own uh, people, our own society. The human race having less and going vegan and not having children and all it's being promoted and pushed and propagandized every out of every corner and pore and facet of our society right now and i think it's happening more and more in the lead up to the agenda 2030 and all the stuff they want to bring in because Ultimately, not only do they not need human labor anymore with automation, but it's just a lot easier to control people when there's less people. I mean, when you think about the mistakes that were made with the population bomb, especially in (laughs) China, there's blood on someone's hands for the forced death that was um, forced onto people and getting them to buy into it. And yet you still have the population bomb authors Paul Early gives speeches about climate change and the environment. He's still coming he's out heard saying with that credibility crap. and <laughs> and uh, and praise and everything. He's been completely John- debunked, and he's still coming out saying it. I'm not going to solve the gigantic problems humanity faces without getting real changes in culture and behavior. behavior. We've got to have cultural evolution. His co-author, John P. Holdren, served in Obama's administration. He gave testimony, and they asked him about the population bomb, and he admitted under oath in his testimony that, oh, well, the population bomb fizzled out, dot, dot, dot. Now listen to what I say about climate change and the environment <laughs> and the restrictions. Because it's already that taken care of behavior. itself. I think he actually said something like it's taken it, care right. of itself it or care something of itself. like that because they knew, because they totally knew. They knew it's not. This is this is the thing. Again, they didn't have the wrong data. They didn't run the wrong algorithm or something. And like, oopsie, we just thought it was going to be bad, but we changed our mind. They knew this is about decades of social engineering to bring society to the place we are at now with this technology. And I see this in every glimpse I see of the younger generation. They have that bleeding heart thing, but they're having the same foolishness in taking advice on what's supposed to be done because of the way they feel about the problems we're facing. Because they've been indoctrinated with YOLO. They've been indoctrinated to think that having children is just too so gotta be hard and yourself. messy and expensive and awful, and I won't get to have as much fun. I just want to play video games and hang out all day and live in my parents' basement till I'm 50 and never even know what freedom was like. Because we live in 1984 means brave new world with this. And it's an intergenerational problem. This has been going on definitely hardcore since World War II, and we've lost a lot of wisdom. <laughs> We're just really backwards, and it's, it's destroying everyone. It really is. I mean, this has to be thought about deeply. I just can't believe that they're actually admitting it in the New York Times. It's like they're just rubbing it in people's faces at this point, honestly, because at this point, admitting it, I mean, when I was saying this stuff like 10 years ago, I was getting laughed at, and I was getting told that I was wrong. I just can't believe they're actually openly saying it, I guess just because now it's too late to do anything. But I don't know. I don't know what the reason is. They're actually, I don't even know why they're admitting it, honestly, at this point. But I just am floored that they are. I don't know. Just next time you hear somebody saying all that stuff about overpopulation and how there's just too many people and yada, yada, blah, blah, maybe you should tell them to read. (laughs) Go ahead and read the New York Times because probably they've been reading it this whole time, which has led them to believe that. And now maybe they can see that that's actually an incorrect assumption.